everybody has a story. I mean, everybody, everybody's life's interesting, you know? And I've run into people say, ah, my life's not interesting. Well, bull, your life was really interesting. There's something in your life that's worth a book or a movie or a short story or a TV episode that you've come across. And it may just have been a fight you had with the kid next door. Welcome to the Going North Podcast, where you will be informed, encouraged, and empowered to embrace your dreams and advance in life through authorship. I'm your host, best-selling author of the book, Stay the Course, and certified leadership trainer, Tom Brightman. Be sure to check out the goods and services from every guest, as well as the host himself, yours truly. Now let the fun begin. Well, it's another great day in the land of podcasting because it's great to have you listening, folks, because we got one heck of a super special awesome human for you today, folks, because my goodness, my man, Mr. Eminem himself, Mickey Mickelson has been hooking me up with some fabulous, talented authors who write multiple genres. And today is one of those occasions, baby, because we have an award winning journalist who's best known for his work as a radio personality and newscaster at KNX 1070 news radio as well as a national correspondent for the upi radio and has written so many books and also is known for a couple of his newer books known as lancer hero of the west series as well as the el paso affair and in addition to that this wonderful gentleman right here is a native of pittsburgh pa and he also grew up in the san fernando valley attending silmar high school and is a screenwriter and short film producer is currently in development of a Western film based on a feature script. And it doesn't even stop there, folks, because he also is a fellow podcast host, hosts a podcast called Interesting People with Bob Brill. So let's give it up for Mr. BB himself, Bob Brill. How you doing today, sir? Good, Don. Good. Yeah, looking forward to it. How you doing, man? Doing well, doing well. It's great to have a legend on the podcast, my man. You've been at this for a while and still kicking. Yeah. <laughs> Thank God for that, huh? <laughs> <laughs> Amen to that. Amen to you that. You fantasy football, Dom? I probably should, but I'm not really into it that much. Uh, okay. Yeah, it, it took me a long time to get into it. And the reason I bring it up is you mentioned the uh, the podcast, Interesting People with Bob Grill. We've kind of backed off that one. I haven't done it well, only because we're doing one called Fantasy Football. Uh, uh, it's called Kramer and Brill. And it's me as a fantasy football expert. And my uh, colleague and co-host is Eric Kramer, who used to be uh, uh, with the Chicago Bears. And he was a quarterback with the Detroit Lions as well. And uh, we, we do that every week now, especially, which is takes up uh, quite a bit. We do a podcast and a video cast, sort of like what you're doing here. And we rip the, uh, with the, the video cast going on the YouTube, my YouTube channel. And then the, we rip the, uh, the audio for the podcast, which, goes on iTunes and every place else. So I, I just want to mention that because I know you mentioned the 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 my podcast. So well, 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 my goodness, well, that's what I'm talking about indeed. And it's really great that you're doing that, especially hitting folks from both ends, especially with video still being the most powerful form of really communicating with yeah, people. It really is. Yes, indeed. So my goodness, so what really Helped you to get started because you got this wonderful radio voice that's been hitting the airways for years and you also know how to write. You've been doing that for years. So where did it all begin for the wonderful Bob? Golly, uh, that's a big question. I guess it all began for me really in probably like uh, the fourth grade. Uh, We had to write an essay about what we wanted to do when we grew up, right? And uh, I well, all I wanted to do was play baseball. I wanted to play second base for my hometown, Pittsburgh Pirates. And uh, that was my goal. I was going to go out when I was 18, fly to Florida or drive down to Florida, try out, and I was going to make it, right, you know? And um, so my teacher, I think it was Mrs. Dunn at the time, asked me, she goes, uh, well, what's your backup? And I said, what's a backup? And she goes, you know, in case you don't make it. And I said, oh, well, I never thought of that, but okay. And I kicked around some ideas and I said, okay, I guess what would keep me close to baseball? And so I decided, okay, that would be uh, play-by-play broadcasting, right? So that became my goal after I realized that I wasn't going to play baseball. And uh, that turned into a radio career, which turned into a newscasting career. And I've always written, 
and I've always wanted to write. I mean, I started writing jokes when I was uh, about six or seven years old and uh, just, you know, I, I wrote all through high school and things like that. And I just, you know, always wanted to write books. Uh, kind of started with my first book, which was Fan Letters to a Stripper, which is um, about Patty Wagon, who was a 1950s and 60s and 40s, actually, burlesque queen, and her husband, who was a Major League Baseball player, uh, Don Rudolph. And um, that uh, turned into a script, which we have been trying to sell and haven't sold it yet. But, you know, we've had some good things happen with it. And then my my radio career just took off after, you know, over the years, I traveled all over the Southwest mainly, ended up at UPI Radio Network, uh, where I became a national correspondent, later bureau chief, uh, traveled the world doing covering stories for them, and um, took some time off from radio, not totally, but just a little bit. And I opened a baseball card store, which was near and dear to my heart. And then in 1909, uh, 2009, uh, when the, um, the recession hit, uh, that kind of we closed that up and moved back into radio, not on a full-time basis, but on a part-time basis, but full-time enough for me. I have a regular shift at KNX three days a week. Sometimes I work four and five, you know, depends on uh, who's ill or whatever. And uh, I've been doing that for so long. It's just, that's kind of pays the bills. And the books are always, you hope, pay the bills at some point. But I've written <laughs> about a dozen of them now because there's, uh, six Lancers in the Lancer series. There will be 10. I usually write, start writing the new Lancer book in December. I write one a year. But the problem is this year, um, I'm working, we shot a documentary. And you mentioned Somar High School. Well, in 1971 was the great Somar earthquake. And I was a senior at Somar High then. And in February, of 2021 is the 50th anniversary. Oh my gosh, I can't believe I'm saying that. You know, and uh, so I always wanted to shoot a documentary on that because I still know a lot of people that were survivors, and I'm a survivor. And uh, so uh, I got together with a partner of mine, and we shot the documentary, and we are in the editing process now. As a matter of fact, that's what I've been doing all day. And uh, so hopefully we'll have that out by February. That's what we, that's the goal day. We've had a couple of pitch sessions. Uh, we, you know, we feel confident somebody's gonna pick it up. It's just a matter of those negotiations and getting that done. And it'll probably be an hour. We may do a director's cut for uh, cinematic, which would be probably an hour and a half. But uh, you know, we got more than enough material and it's just a great subject. And so uh, all that combined, uh, I'm kind of staying busy. Amen to that. Definitely staying busy indeed, especially surviving an earthquake. Is that what made you go to the Southwest? <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, um, my my daughter lives in Texas and there was a thought of moving there at some point. But, you know, you have hurricanes and if you go south, you have uh, tornadoes. I lived in Oklahoma for a while and during my radio career and, you know, I knew what tornadoes were like. And, you know, it's we have our earthquakes out here. But you know, the bottom line is you have two things that happen out here, actually three, two good, one bad. The money's better, the weather's fantastic and the cost of living is ridiculous. You know, <laughs> so it's like, go, it's like when a quarterback throws a long pass, two out of three things are not good. <laughs> Only one is good, but it's just a little bit, a little bit different, but you know, that's just the situation and, and, um, you know, in my radio career it, and in my film career, which I'm still working on that, uh, and I've shot four short films, you know, you kind of have to be here. I mean, you can do it in other states. I mean, Atlanta has a, has a growing industry. North Carolina has a growing industry. Uh, Houston, I mean, um, Dallas has a growing industry. Uh, so there are industries out there and there are places to work, uh, but it's still, it's Hollywood's still the central part of, of that genre. And that's kind of, you know, and my wife's a Southern Californian and she's got two daughters that are pregnant. So it'll be her first grandkid. So there ain't no way I'm getting out of here. <laughs> <laughs> uh, don't blame you. Don't blame you at all. And heck, you are still right. Like Hollywood's still like a central figure of that and the place to be really, especially with your line of work and yeah. heck, even having family there too. It's like, well, this is the 
two balls in the chain. <laughs> Forget the <laughs> one ball in the chain. <laughs> oh my goodness. So with all of your wonderful travels, surviving an earthquake and still writing books, what probably helps you to stay creative? Just the juices, you know, uh, never wanting to retire. You know, I, I, I think about, you know, people say, well, why don't you retire, you know? And, and it's like, I don't want to, you know? Number one, if you keep writing and keep doing stuff, it staves off Alzheimer's, I'm told. So that's a good thing. I have a billion stories that I want to tell. I've written, right now, I think I'm at 20 feature film scripts and or TV pilots. And will all of them get produced? No, I know that. But, you know, I like to have a few of them produced. And I've got five or six that are in my mind that I've written notes on to actually go ahead and do at some point. And I'm working with a, a friend of mine from junior high and high school who's also a writer who lives now in Atlanta. And we're, um, as soon as this documentary is finished, uh, we're actually going to get down to brass tacks and be writing a, um, uh, a script um, that is I, a long time in the waiting for me. I've been wanting to write this script. And the only problem is I've been unable to find an African-American writer to write it with me because it's really a black and white script. And I can't write from, for instance, your point of view, and technically, really, you can't write from my point of view, you know, so, and it's a script that delves, blends the two, and it's historical, but it's fantasy, and I don't mean fantasy as in, um, you know, um, sci-fi, I mean fantasy as far as time travel, and it's uh, someone gets transported to um, the modern day, and Black Lives Matter and a whole bunch of other uh, issues come up and to deal with the whole thing and change in history and what would happen if history did change and so on and so forth. So um, it's a script that I've been dying to write and I've had uh, four guys who I've talked to who were interested but eventually bailed on me. And I was interviewing this friend of mine for the, um, for the documentary. And we started talking and I thought, you know, maybe, maybe Michael Andre would be interested. And I approached him with it and he loved the idea. So we've been throwing ideas back and forth and um, it's, it, it's great. I mean, it, it's really been interesting. He brought up some things that I didn't know or not so much I didn't know, but didn't think about as much and that need to go in the script. And I brought up some things that he now realizes that have to be in the script. So it's gonna be fun. Uh, it's going to be a challenge, but it's going to be fun. We'll start working on that probably in, in hardcore in January. So, but it's, it's to get back to your original question. I know I went around about on that. It's the juices. I got stories to tell that it keep popping in my mind or developing. And uh, so I want to keep doing it. Hey, that's good right there. It sounds like an interesting project with that time travel fantasy <laughs> script that you're going to be working on in the coming weeks because <laughs> that's what it's going to feel like <laughs> yeah oh my goodness so such a say the juices basically do you mean like basically the stories that you've been wanting to tell or is there another inspiration for those stories that you want to tell no i think um you know i tackled the western series and you know this is the uh latest lancer this is the uh, broken bow affair and I know on Zoom, you have to hold it up in front of your face or you don't see it. Um, and that uh, I've also turned into an audio book we're waiting for approval on. And then we just got approval on this as an audio book. This is Al Kabul, Homegrown Terrorist, which is a novel that I wrote uh, several years ago. And um, I hired somebody to do the voice on that. Lancer, I'm doing the voice on. So we'll have two audio books out there. And there's just so many outlets now whether it's audiobooks or podcasts, I write a, a, a weekly blog on baseball in the 1960s. Uh, there's, you know, there's just so many things. And, you know, it's funny, but, um, I'll, I'll be driving down the street and I'll see something just out of the corner of my eye, whether it's somebody walking down the street or whether it's a person with a dog or maybe a car, it could just be anything. 
and a scene will pop into my head and I'll just all of a sudden have a, a movie script in about 10 minutes. You know, it just happens that way for me. And, you know, and I, what I'll do is I'll grab my phone and I'll record into my phone just some thoughts and notes, you know, um, and uh, so I have it for later. And then when I get home, I'll down, I'll transcribe that into an email and send it to myself and, and I'll have that for someday when I get to that script. And it's, I think that's probably it. I've always just had an active mind with um, just, I see things uh, and I see stories. And, you know, it could be, because I my feeling's always been, everybody has a story. I mean, everybody, everybody's life's interesting, you know? And I've run into people say, ah, my life's not interesting. Well, bull, your life was really interesting. There's something in your life that's worth a book or uh, a movie or a short story or a TV episode that you've come across. And it may just have been, a fight you had with the kid next door or a touching moment with your mom or maybe your grandfather. It could be anything. It could be the day you kicked the dog and realized, oh my gosh, I'm not supposed to kick a dog, you know? Uh, so it could be all kinds of things that, you know, create a little bit of a story that is a story for you to tell. And, and we all tell stories. We all will be in a crowd um, and just standing around, you know, it would, it's funny when I was in junior high school, I'm, I'm Italian American. And when I was in junior high school at that time, uh, there'd be a bunch of my friends out on the, the, um, the quad, you know, during lunch break. And I'll be standing around and this is just is dating the time. That's all. And at the time, it was not uncommon to be telling in junior high, you know, how junior high kids are uh, stories and jokes about uh, Polish people, which at the time they were called Polacks, uh, Jewish jokes, Italian jokes, whatever. And I'd have a bunch of friends out on the quad during lunch break and they would uh, be out telling quote unquote Polak jokes until I walked up. And then all those Polak jokes turned into Italian jokes because they wanted to get me. And so that that's a story that talks about prejudice. And it's a story that I would like to explore at some point and do, you know, either a short film or I don't know if it's worthy of a feature film, but I'm sure it is because I can get into all the kids' backgrounds and what goes on at home and what leads to all that. So yeah, there's a coming of age story there. So, uh, you know, we think back about anything that happened in your life. I look at, I look at my whole life as a movie. I figure when I get to the pearly gates, God's going to look at me and say, okay, before you walk in, let me show you a movie of your life. And I'm sure it'll take more than 20 minutes, you know, but, you know, but, you know he and St. Peter will either get together and say, okay, you're in or you're out, you know, and, or is there anything you like to change in your life? <laughs> I have no idea, you know? So anyway, I think there's stories that need to be told. I have many of them and they keep popping up. So. Hey, well, you said a powerful thing right there is the, that you see your life as a movie and heck, even if everybody would take that perspective, especially if they're looking to embrace their creative edge and really heck, even put it to paper or heck, even maybe put it on film if there's their desire. Like that's really a great example to follow. Thank you. I appreciate that. Yes, sir. Indeed. Yes, sir. Indeed. So since this is far from your first rodeo, is there a question that you wish should be asked more often when you're being on the guest side of the interview game? Wow. Boy, you know, I really can't think of one off the top, you know, because everybody asks where they can find my books. And of course, everybody knows that's Amazon to start or bobbrillbooks.com. Uh, that's the easiest way, those two places. A lot of people want to know, you know, about me getting beat up in the LA riots and, you know, uh, in, uh, after the Rodney King verdict and I usually tell people about that, but, you know, I, I'm, as far as what people want to know, I don't know. I mean, uh, I, 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 I don't, I, I can't think of anything that, you know, uh, people don't ask me that, uh, uh, that I'd want to ask, uh, you know, my, my love of sports is mainly with my, my Pittsburgh teams we don't have an NBA team, so I'm not a big NBA guy. You know, we've never had that. We had an ABA team and an ABL team back in the day in the 70s. But um, I love my Pittsburgh Pirates. I, you know, uh, I'm a season ticket holder for the Rams 
only because it's a good chance to make money. <laughs> <laughs> and that's, you know, I'll be honest with you. And, and my wife is a Rams fan. She's a Steeler fan too, because of me, but um, she's also a Rams fan because she's born and raised here. So um, uh, I told her, yeah, you could go to a game or two a game that I can't sell the tickets to. <laughs> Hey, I sell baseball cards. I love baseball cards, you know, and it's like sitting next to me here. I've got vintage baseball cards that are up on eBay on my, my eBay store. And so, you know, I've got um, lots of um, things that I do, lots of things I'm involved in, you know, and like, for instance, you know, I love baseball cards, you know, and I grew up loving baseball cards. And, you know, that's uh, one of the things I enjoy doing. And I, like I said, I had a baseball card store at one point. I guess the other thing too is I, I really am someone who is, uh, I'm left of center, you know, uh, I tell people, you know, when people find out you're a born again Christian, which I don't like that term because it means to most people that I'm right of center and I'm not, um, it, it's one of those things that, you know, I, I, I am, I'm not quite super liberal and I'm not like the radical left, but I'm just, I, I, I call myself left of center. I was raised in a democratic household, became a Republican. Uh, as soon as I got out of high school, I registered Republican because I looked at it and I said, Republicans are the people that make money, you know? So that's what <laughs> I did. And uh, I recognized that at like 18. And then I realized later on in my life, probably during the Clinton term that, you know, I. I became a Democrat. My, my youngest son asked me, he says, dad, why are you doing that? You can't leave the party. And I said, I didn't leave the party. The party left me, you know? And uh, I found out I had a different type of heart, you know? And it's an interesting thing. I go around with some folks about it. And I try not to talk politics, mainly because uh, we can't in our business, you know, as journalists, we can't take a side. Matter of fact, under the old CBS rules, wow. You couldn't even have a bumper sticker that was political on your car because you had to be non-biased and you know everything i know i do i try to stick right down the middle I, i'm doing a story a political story we try to stick as close you know do the facts and stick as much to the middle as you can um but you know you do have to challenge people too so that's probably enough politics for me today <laughs> <laughs> um i'm pretty sure there's enough politics for <laughs> everybody with the current state of affairs <laughs> yeah since we're since we're filming this a uh, couple of days after the 2020 november 3rd election yeah it probably is <laughs> yeah you could definitely say that again my goodness my goodness but hey that's really awesome too and it's really interesting especially the fact that you explore really looks like a lot of your wonderful creative juices and really letting it all explode especially the fact with your baseball blog actually right as if you're in the 1950s and 60s right mm -hmm. 1960s yeah it's called the baseball of the 1960s and it comes out every tuesday night uh and it's got a good following and it's really fun because it only involves 10 years so everything and that was my era i'll be honest with you, that was my era and that's when I was, you know, I was uh, seven years old in 1960 and uh, through my junior high and high school years. So that was my era. And I know a lot about what happened those years, but there's also a lot for me to research. And so it, it's really fun for me because I get to relive that stuff and it's targeted to baby boomers, you know, and occasionally I'll get some people who aren't boomers who write in and they'll email me and say, Hey, I loved your story. It was great. I, I use, the pictures, most of them I use baseball cards. I'll take a, if there's a, a YouTube video, a short video, 20, 40 seconds, uh, I'll put that in the top if it relates. People love looking at the old baseball cards as the pictures of them writing about Sandy Koufax. I'll use like a 1965 Sandy Koufax card uh, and others, and I'll put the links in there. And uh, I use, I really use a lot from uh, one of the best websites in the world baseballreference.com, which is unbelievable if you're a baseball fan. And they have football and hockey and basketball now too. But if you're a baseball fan and you don't know about that site, my gosh, you got to go there. It is absolutely magnificent and easy to use. Everything you want to know about any statistic and player in baseball, it's there. Um, 
And, you know, so that is one of my, always been one of my passions. And the fact that I get to write about that and am I making any money at it? No, but it's one of those things I don't really care on, on that because it, it, it's an outlet for me. It, it's, it, it comes from in here and it comes from in here. And it, it's um, to see when people email me or make comments or when I post on Facebook, their comments on Facebook, 99% um, of them are positive. Uh, occasionally if somebody says, why are you dumping this in? The, it, this isn't a Cleveland Indian story and why am I seeing a link to your column in the Cleveland Indians fan page, you know? Okay, so not this week, but next week it'll be a Cleveland, you know, Cleveland Indians. You have fans there that like the column, you know? So, but it, it's a lot of fun, I enjoy it. Amen to that, amen to that. Definitely gotta have a passion project and keep something you're passionate about to at least get your mind off of the reality for a bit. <laughs> Yeah, that's for sure. You know, I deal a lot with that, the reality part of it uh, in my regular job, the job that pays the bills. And that's as a, a news anchor. I'm a news anchor uh, and also a reporter. When I'm not on the air anchoring the news, I'm you know, in radio, uh, I'm as a reporter. And, you know, that's, you know how that goes. If you listen to all news radio or any radio station that has news, you know, most of it is what's going on right now. And most of what's going on right now is kind of on the negative side. Um, stories about COVID, stories about politics, even sports, you know? So um, it's just the way the world is. And it's just, we have to cover those stories first and foremost. Uh, I guess uh, I worked, um, I was a news director for a radio station in Bakersfield at KUZZ many years ago. And Buck Owens, the country singer, uh, was the owner of the radio station. And we got to talking one day and uh, some of his friends were questioning some of the stories that I was doing. And uh, Buck came out and said, well, nobody wants to hear about the bank that didn't get robbed. Nobody wants to hear about the guy that was walking down the street and didn't get murdered. Nobody wants to hear about the politician who didn't get indicted. <laughs> <laughs> so so that's the story you have to cover, you know, and unfortunately it's true. You know, we do a fair share uh, in news in general, a fair share of feature stories. And I love feature stories. And I, I I'd be honest with you, I do them very well. Uh, I did dozens of radio documentaries uh, for UPI Radio Network, which are half hour documentaries over the years, as well as, you know, two and a half minute features. So. Uh, and I love doing them. You get to mix music and you get to mix sound. And but the only ones I really do nowadays are um, throwbacks or, you know, obituaries. You know, we get a Hollywood actor that dies and, you know, I'm usually called on to do the obit. And, uh, you know, you pull some scenes from a movie or a TV show and, and some music from the show or whatever, maybe something else he did. And uh, to be honest with you, I know it sounds really morbid, but I really enjoy those mainly because it's historical and I'm, and I'm an historian. I mean, which is why I really enjoy writing the Lancer Hero of the West series, you know? And uh, I write, I started writing those. Um, my father and I would watch the 1950s and early 60s Westerns together on TV. And that's what Lancer is. Lancer is a compilation of those guys who, you know, whether it's, um, uh, Johnny Yuma or Josh Randall or Paladin or those guys, most of those guys, together with my own creation and my own edition. And one of my own editions is the guy has a sweet tooth, which I do, and he ha he carries Turkish delight in his saddlebags. And he uses it for a number of reasons, but also to, um, uh, to woo his women, so to speak, because it's a very sweet, gooey treat. And, and I don't know, a lot of people don't know what Turkish delight is, but it's a delicious little treat. And so I resisted writing a Western novel for years, mainly because of the research. Mm -hmm. And then when the internet came along, the research became much easier. And if you're writing fiction, you're making stuff up. But in my books, he always, Lancer always runs into historical figures along the way whether it's he, he hangs out with Wyatt Earp and Johnny Ringo and Doc Holliday because he works out at Tombstone. So every novel starts there. But he, he runs into, you know, um, Jesse James or Geronimo or, or some other historical figure. And that's a story that I make up, you know, but it's based in fact. 
And the, the fact based is, you know, most people, if you're reading fantasy, you're reading fantasy. And, you know, you can pretty much make up anything you want within reason. But if you're writing a Western novel and you're writing fiction, fans of Western novels know what happened in those days. So you have to be really careful. Like my perfect example is uh, in the New Orleans affair, um, much of it took place on a riverboat. Well, the riverboat had to have a name. And so I had to research, this took place in 1882. I couldn't have them on a riverboat that was built in 1884. I had to have put them on a riverboat that was built before 1882 and still existed in 1882. It didn't sink or anything like that. So I went back to the historical records, which now on the internet took me 20 minutes. In the old days, before the internet, it would have taken me weeks of researching books and writing letters and, you know, and, and it, I can, I feel for authors back then because when it came to research, they didn't have what we have today. It made them work harder. Um, they also had to use carbon paper, which good Lord, thank we don't have that anymore. Um, but, you know, so when it came to that uh, and all my Lancer books really are dedicated to my father and uh, who passed away when I was like 30 and um, and I also, for Uber fans, if they write me and stuff, a lot of times what I do is I will create a character in the next book using their name. And so they kind of get to see themselves in the book. And I've done that on several occasions and it's, it's always worked out well. I always tell them ahead of time, you know, I don't tell them what the character is gonna be, but I, uh, <laughs> you know, but, you know, and, and, you know, I haven't written anybody in who's a hooker, you know, but so, <laughs> I will get permission on that one. <laughs> Better known as a dance hall girl. <laughs> well, it's good to know you appreciate your fans. <laughs> <laughs> oh man, it's good to get warning too. Let's see. Uh, I can write somebody named Dom in there too. I, you know, you want to be a good guy or a bad guy? <laughs> I will go a good guy. <laughs> I could be one of the townspeople or something. <laughs> sure, why not? Sure, why not? I'll, I'll, I'll put you in there. You heard it here first. I got permission to use your name. I'll do it. <laughs> and it didn't even. Now my question is. Do I have to write a black guy or can I write a white guy? I think I, I need to write a black guy, right? Well, to be honest, I mean, black guys prefer it, but if you want to make them white, I'm all for no, it. No, 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 no. Let's keep it true to form here. If And because, you know, it's interesting because in the next book, the outline of the next book, I do have a prominent black character. And I was searching for a name. So there you go. You're in. Sweet. All right. <laughs> Feels good to be in. <laughs> That's what I'm talking about. <laughs> Woohoo! Well, coming down to the magical question for every single guest, and that is if you're to wake up tomorrow and you were 25 again, but this time in the current year with all of your amassed knowledge and experience, what advice would you give to yourself? Number one, probably take a few more classes in business, probably go to college period, and definitely take some screenwriting classes. And uh, also, I think definitely make sure something came out of a paycheck into a 401. Although that, that might not be a good idea because I was divorced from my first wife years later and I have to give her half. So I'm not so sure. Maybe that's not a good idea. <laughs> you know, I, I, I told somebody years ago that um, I'd like to live to 120, which is my, still my goal. Um, and I always wanted the last check I write to bounce. And then I thought about it. I said, nah, I don't think so. I think I want to leave a little bit to somebody, mainly my kids, you know, I'm more like, at that point, my grandsons, you know, my grandchildren have uh, both uh, boys and girls. 
And uh, so, yeah, I, so I think I gave up on that. I still haven't given up on 120 because I keep figuring with modern medicine, we're about 20 years behind. And if I can live to 120, that's really like 100, you know? And um, so what the heck? Or 140, one of the two, I don't know. Uh, I figured it out once and it, it worked out pretty well, so. <laughs> oh, love it. Love it indeed. <laughs> it's like, yeah. It's like, yeah, you know, forget the 401. The first wife took half. <laughs> <laughs> Well, you know, you asked me that question, I had to think about it because I thought for a second, okay, do I have the foreknowledge? Because if I had the foreknowledge, man, I'd be in Vegas left and right. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> every, I, I'd, I'd pick every, every trifecta for every horse that ever ran. Are you kidding me? <laughs> I'd have all those lottery numbers. <laughs> be like back to the future, what, round two? <laughs> me and Biff. Oh man, yeah, not not exactly. <laughs> Folks have been like, "No, nah, you got to go back. No, nah, you got to go back." <laughs> oh man. So of course, once again, for the folks who want to keep in contact with the wonderful Bob himself, what's the best way, folks, to reach out to you, my man? Oh, that's the easiest thing. Uh, number one, if you Google Bob Brill, just Bob Brill, I will come up about seventeen of the top twenty. And I like to tell people I'm not Bob Brill, the IP attorney in Chicago. I'm not Bob Brill, the Emmy, uh, the uh, Tony winning set designer. I'm not Bob Brill, the drummer for Berlin. And I am definitely not the Bob Brill, the bodybuilder. Definitely not. That guy's way out there. But I'm, I'm Bob Brill and I will come up the most. And all of this you can find at bobbrill.com. Uh, you can find me there. Uh, you can go to Kramerandbrill.com, which is where we have our fantasy football podcast uh, and video cast. I have a couple of other websites, but the easiest way, really, just bobbrill.com, and that has links to everything. It has my email, my phone number. You can reach me pretty much. I'm, I'm pretty easy to find. Um, I, you know, uh, and remember that every Lancer book has a holster, but there's no gun in the holster. And the reason for that is Lancer's a thinking man. First of all, he uses his brains. If that doesn't work, he uses his brawn. And if that doesn't work, he goes to the gun. And it doesn't matter then because you're dead. <laughs> uh, gotta love it. <laughs> oh man, never gonna pick up this series indeed. So there you have it, folks. Head over to bobbrill.com. Check out all of his wonderful books and the books to come and be on the lookout for that documentary as well, folks. It's definitely going to be earth shattering too. <laughs> yes, it will. <laughs> That's Shaken. Uh, it's called Shaken, the Great Somar Earthquake. And it'll be out in February. That's what I'm talking about, folks. Check it out like a library book. So any parting words before we close up shop, Bob? Just Tom, um, thank you very much. Uh, I'll look forward. I'll probably start writing the next Lancer book in uh, January. Try to have it out by the April Cowboy Fest. If there's going to be a Cowboy Festival in Santa Clarita this year, they called it off last year due to COVID. And uh, look for you in the book. <laughs> Sweet. Yep, you'll be there. And thanks again. I really appreciate it. This has been fun. How's it going, my friend? I'm glad you made it to the end. That shows that you really enjoyed what you heard and you are an uncommon finisher. Thanks for giving this show a listen. If you really want to help out the show, be sure to subscribe, leave a review, and share this with someone that you care about or someone that needs to hear this message because you want to spread this podcast around like butter on bread if that's your type of thing and if it's not your type of thing still spread it around anyway because good stuff needs to be shared with good people like yourself <laughs>